Welcome back to Steve's World of Wonders. Banana, Musa, Cuminata. The banana is a tall specimen consisting of a hollow tube formed by closely wrapped leaf sheets, above which enormous blades form a spreading crown. It is said that banana plants are as important to inhabitants of the tropics as are green plants to those living in cooler regions. The unripe fruit is rich in starch, which changes to sugar when ripe. The leaves are used to make mats and bags and packing materials, cigarette papers and fiber juice from the stem is used on burns and blisters. Toronto Horticultural Society, founded in 1834 under the patronage of Sir John Colburn, Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada from 1828 to 1836. This was the first horticultural society organized in this province, established to encourage the introduction and cultivation of improved varieties of fruits, plants, and vegetables. Its first president was the Honorable George Markland, Inspector General of Upper Canada. An oval of five acres was donated to the Society by the Honorable George W. Allen, and on September 11, 1860, the Horticultural Gardens were opened by the Prince of Wales, Edward the Seventh. Additional land was leased from the Municipality of Toronto in 1864, and in 1888, this park was turned over to the city. It was named Allen Gardens in 1901. Allen Gardens is one of the oldest parks in Toronto, situated in the heart of Toronto. Just a 10 minute walk from Ryerson University. The greenhouses are open every day of the year and are free admission. The greenhouses have seasonal displays and is especially nice to visit in winter as it's heated and features tropical plants and cactuses or cacti and bright flowers, a nice respite from the cold winter gray. There are plant sales and events and gardening workshops and hands-on activities for kids. Places like these are important, furthering education on plant care, soil types, ecosystems, seeds, and biodiversity. The original Allen Gardens Fountain foreground was constructed on the original rustic pavilion site at the park center.
1878, the board of the directors of the society met that autumn to decide on a plan of action to replace the pavilion. They obtained the permission of both Mr. Allen and the city council to use the gardens as security on a $20,000 loan. The funds were used for the construction of the new Horticultural Society's Pavilion, which opened in the summer of 1879. The Toronto-based architectural firm of Langley, Langley & Burke designed the impressive 75 foot by 120 foot wood, iron, and glass structure. It was situated just west of the original rustic pavilion midway between Carlton and Girard. A 45 foot by 48 foot conservatory was later added onto its south side. The new building was considered one of the finest facilities of the type in the country and it was in constant demand for promenade concerts, gala balls, conventions, and flower shows. The stage of the auditorium could easily accommodate a chorus and orchestra of up to 200 performers. The same architects were also responsible for the design of the towering 25-foot tall fountain and its massive 45-foot wide stone basin. This magnificent water feature was built on the site of the original pavilion. In 1888, despite the garden's increasing popularity, the debt-ridden society was compelled to convey its holdings plus its leasehold interests in the adjoining land to the city corporation. The city in return also assumed two existing mortgages on the property totaling $35,000. Once assuming control of the gardens, the city began investing over $9,000 annually on park improvements and expansion. In 1889, some of these funds went towards the installation of a decorative iron fence around the grounds and the conversion of the existing outdoor gas lamps to electrical lights. The development of the horticultural gardens continued steadily during the next few years. In 1892, when the tall shrubbery, shrubbery along the Girard Street was replaced with sod and flower beds, the residents of Toronto gained new panoramic views of the park. In 1894, the Horticultural Pavilion was further modernized by the addition of a refreshment room and the replacement of the old conservatory with a more spacious 90-foot and 61-foot facility. Lida and the Swan. At the edge of the pond, you will see a fine example of decorative lead statuary from England. It depicts the story from Greek mythology of Lida and the Swan. Lida was the queen of Sparta. Noted for her great beauty, she liked to bathe in the river Eurotas 
where Zeus, king of the gods, first saw her. To be close to her, Zeus metamorphized into a white swan and made a fierce eagle pretend to be pursuing him. Taking pity on the swan, Leda took him under her arm to protect him, not knowing that the great white bird was the mightiest of the gods. Zeus proceeded to seduce her, and following their union, Leda brought forth two eggs. One of the eggs produced Helen, the future Helen of Troy, and Pollux. From the other came Castor and Clytemestra, the children of her husband Tyndareus. The story of Leda and the Swan fixed the amorous connotation of swan symbolism for centuries to follow. Here's an original tiered fountain in the foreground in front of the pavilion. This is the Rose Garden in 1913, located at the Sherborne St. Gerard corner of Allen Gardens. 1913, in keeping with the popular horticultural trends of the turn of the century, the garden beds and pathway systems were laid out in a formal symmetrical fashion. The ornamental park fountain formed the center of the axial park design. A small scale replica of this same fountain can be seen in the St. James Park today. Surrounding the water feature, Canis alternathera, Santolina, Agonias, Coleus, and Agaves were set out into intricate carpet bed designs. At this time, the dirt lane, which eventually became Horticultural Avenue, formed the western boundary of the park. West of this point, the Jarvis Street Baptist Church medicinal plants. For thousands of years, plants have played an important role in human health. Ancient societies looked to plants for medicinal wonder drugs. It was the study of traditional folk medicine that led scientists to the discovery of aspirin and codeine, drugs that have transformed modern me medical practice. Today, many pharmaceutical companies are exploring the potential of the plant kingdom for new medicines, but they face a race against time for growing deforestation, species extinction, and loss of knowledge about traditional medicinal plants. More than 25% of modern prescription drugs are based on or produced from natural compounds found in certain plants and animals. Experts predict that as many as 25% of all plant species, an estimated 60,000 could become extinct by 2050. Less than 10% of known plant species have been screened for their medicinal value.